change up a couple of the things. But I'm a native San Diegan. I um, grew up uh, in Golden Hill, so a little bit further uh, west up here. But I'm very familiar with Kensington, my favorite ice cream place, Mariposa Ice Cream, is right down the street. And uh, my very good friend, who was the teacher for the, the people at San Diego State, Ricardo Griswold and Castillo, Professor Dr. Professor Ricardo Griswold and Castillo, he lives right down the street over here. So when we were working on this book called Border Angels, The Power of One, uh, we used to meet at the Kensington Cafe. And then I would just share stories with him and tell him what I was doing, and he'd jot them down, and before you knew it, we, we had a book. So uh, Border Angels uh, is a, a nonprofit group. You might have seen us in the news. I started the organization back in 1986, so we've been around for a long, long time. And what happened was, between my uh, bachelor and my master's at the University of San Diego, where I did most of my studies and I got my master's from, I met a woman from El Salvador. And she said, Enrique, oftentimes you're collecting things to try to help your fellow man, and you take them down to some of the needier people in Tijuana. How about the needy people here in San Diego? And I said, well, I kind of live in a, in a needy neighborhood. I live in a working class community, Golden Hill. And she says, no, where I live, I live in Carlsbad. And there's migrants that live there too. And they live outdoors. I go, what do you mean they live outdoors? She goes, yes, they live in the canyons. Remember, this is 1986, a lot different from what's going on today, and very similar to what's going on today. So I went into those canyons back in 1986, and I couldn't believe that families were living there. And thanks to these families, we have food on our table, they take care of our kids, they build our homes. And these families are just like yourselves, maybe a couple of hundred years ago, wherever you came from to come to this country. I doubt it that there's anybody here that's 100% indigenous. I have indigenous blood, but I'm not 100% indigenous. So probably everybody here in this sanctuary came from a different part of the world. And you face some of the same obstacles, and you have other opportunities. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But before we get started, I just wanted to say I'm delighted to be here. We're going to show a short video. And this video really is, uh, to me, something very special. Because uh, my life work is dedicated to, uh, to that the, the only way that you can overcome hate is with love. The only way you can overcome darkness is with light. And what better light, what better love is reflected than with our children. So last year's theme, and it's really our lifelong theme, is, is love our children. So one of our uh, border angels, Pam, she did this video, and uh, you're going to see it. And it, it, it is focused around a celebration we're going to be having in a couple of weeks at Friendship Park, which is the park where San Diego and Tijuana uh, are divided by that terrible wall. And there's a park on each side. And that park was inaugurated by First Lady Pat Nixon back in 1971. And she said, may there never be a wall between these two great countries. We all know what's happened. So every April 30th in Mexico, we celebrate Children's Day. So what we do is the Sunday closest to that, we do a big event at, at Friendship Park. This year it will be April 27th. You're all more than welcome to join us. It's going to be at 12 noon. I have invited the First Lady of San Diego, like I did last year, and the First Lady of Tijuana. And we'll, we'll do a nice event, music on both sides, we'll have toys for the kids, and just celebrating the fact that love, love has no borders. So we're going to go ahead and uh, show the video. And
Was the, um, we had a, an event last year, which is our annual fundraising event in November, that's what that last flyer was about. And uh, those last pictures there, for the Children's Day celebration, our intention was just to have, you know, that we're going to do this this month, children on both sides singing, we give them toys, we have music, etc. However, last year, I, I meet every quarter or so with the Chief of the Border Patrol, Paul Beeson. So Paul and I get together, and last year I said, Paul, why don't we, uh, you know, there's that door at Friendship Park where Operation Gatekeepers that well, there's actually a door. But it's never been opened before. And if there's an emergency, that's what you need that door for, then it's rusted, and, and if there really is an emergency, there's no way you can open it. And I go, why don't we uh, open it for the Children's Day celebration? So he goes, okay. And uh, so lo and behold, I, I drive up, and I'm, I'm with the First Lady of San Diego back then, Ronald Ingram, and as I'm driving up, there's a young man that recognizes me. He says, oh, my, my family's on the other side, I'd like to see them. And I go, yeah, well, every Sunday, every Saturday and Sunday all year from 10 to 2, you can go there. And you can see your loved ones on the other side of the wall there. But you can't touch them, you can just see them. That's what, you know, that mesh is really thick and all that. And, uh, and I said, why don't you, you know, just drive up with us? So he did. And as I get there, and we're just about to open the door, all of a sudden, somebody says, you know that young man you were talking to? I just found out that he's never hugged his daughter. She's on the Mexican side. I go, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, he's never hugged his daughter. So I said, well, today he's going to hug her. So his name's Luis, and I go, Luis, you know, here's a Border Angel t-shirt, just stand next to me, and we'll 
pretend like you're part of the ceremony. Don't say anything to the Border Patrol, because they're going to say, oh no, there's no way. So anyways, uh, I didn't want to take that risk. So what happens is the door opens, and as the door opens, Luis is standing next to me, he's a young man, 25 years old. And that little tiny girl, Jimena, she's five years old, but she's really small for being five. And she, uh, she can't take it, and she just jumps into his arms. And for two minutes, we had two minutes to have the door open. So for two minutes, we just all were crying, and there's nothing we could really say. It was such a beautiful yet sad moment at the same time. And that was really fantastic. And, and uh, so then we go back to the respective sides of the wall. So then I asked Luis, I said, uh, so what's your story? You know, how come, you know? And he, so he told me, and I go, well, you know, every Tuesday, the Border Angels, we have free services for uh, people that need advice on immigration issues. We have immigration attorneys that come to our office. And for free, you know, we'll give, give you advice. So if anybody here doesn't know somebody, every Tuesday, like yesterday, from 6 to 7 p.m. So Luis shows up on Tuesday, and to make a long story short, Jimena is now living with Luis here in San Diego. So they're together. Uh, now, usually you don't have that type of a situation play out you know, that way, but there's one success story, and, and for that family, you know, that's, that's, that, there's nothing that can be bad, that the family can be united. And we're, we're big believers, the Border Angels, in this power of one. This power of one. Um, I went to the University of San Diego, like I mentioned, for most of my schooling. Um, and there's a guy that came and spoke at my school. And his uh, grandfather is a hero of mine and, and probably a hero of everybody in this room. His grandfather was Mahatma Gandhi. So Gandhi's grandson comes to USD and he gave a talk and he says, some of you have heard this story, but I, I really cherish this story. And it's, it's about a man walking along the beach with his son. And as he's walking along the beach with his son, his son is picking up these starfish and he's throwing the starfish into the ocean. So the father says to the son, son, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm throwing these starfish into the ocean. And the father says, yeah, I can see that, but but why, son? He goes, Dad, it's so hot out here, and the tide has gone in. These starfish are dying. And the father says, yes, son, but there's thousands of starfish. What you do doesn't make any difference. And the little boy picked up a starfish, and he shows it to his father, and he says, it'll make a difference to this one. The power of one. For that starfish, it makes all the difference in the world. For Luis and for Jimena, that made all the difference in the world. So we're big believers in this, uh, the, the power of one and the starfish story. And I share the story all the time. And I remember I used to be in professional baseball, I used to be with the Padres, and while I was with the Padres, I, uh, I got invited to this, uh, to this television show that if you speak Spanish, you probably uh, are familiar with it. It's called Sabado Gigante. It's not you're familiar with this. It's a very serious show, as you can tell. It's the number one Spanish language show in the world, and, and it's the, the host is bigger than life, Don Francisco and all that. So anyways, they invite me out, so they fly me out to Miami, and when I come out of the show, Don Francisco, he says, El Angel de la Frontera, or the Border Angel. That's how we got our name. That's what we're called, Border Angels. I didn't want to be called the Border Angel, but I, I like the name for the group, because it's very appropriate. Border Angels, it's about the borders, it's something good, etc. So the Border Angels, we started in 1986, and eventually we, uh, we've, we've expanded, especially after that show. After that show, now we have about 3,500 volunteers. We're an all-volunteer group, we're a 501 c 3 For the first 15 years, we didn't have a name, um, we weren't a 501 c 3 but for the last 13 years, we've been a 501 c 3 And we're based in Sherman Heights, in the Sherman Heights Community Center. So I didn't have an office, the office was wherever I lived. And now we have a little office inside the Sherman Heights Community Center. And we had a meeting today, but the board meeting today was not about the Border Angels, it's about another organization I started called the House of Mexico. Because incredibly, if you go to Balboa Park, if you go to the International Cottages, uh, there's no House of Mexico. And, and back in 1995, when I was the president of the Hispanic Chamber, and I first started with the Padres, um, I wanted to have an event there. And back then, my girlfriend was, uh, well, she still is. She's not my girlfriend anymore, but she's married now. But she's <laughs> Swedish. So we went to the Balboa Park to, to do, you know, to scout out of, you know, the House of Mexico to do the event. And there was no House of Mexico. So we did, did the event at the House of Sweden. <laughs> so anyways, uh, to this day, there's still not a House of Mexico, but we're gonna have one. So I, on Monday, I had a meeting with uh, the new mayor, and I said, uh, I recommend that we have a House of Mexico before the Centennial. You got a lot of bad press, Centennial Committee, SeaWorld, and so on and so forth. I go, I don't think you want people realizing that there's not a House of Mexico for the House of Mexico, or for the celebration, when the President of Mexico is coming and others, and they go, where's the House of Mexico? So anyways, so we're working on a lot of different things. But the Border Angels, 
it's not a religious group, it's a faith-based group. And our, uh, our mission statement, if I was hungry, did you give me to eat? If I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? That's our mission statement. And regardless of the person, if the person is a, is a, is a veteran under the bridge, a city college there, or the person's a migrant out in the, in the canyon, in the canyons, we try to help, we focus on the migrant community. But we get donations all the time, people are bringing us clothes and, and food. I don't want that in the office, I want that out within 24 hours. So we'll give it away to the, my good friend over at the Alpha Project, or, or, or different organizations, we try to move it as, as quickly as possible. It doesn't do us any good to have the, the things there. What I really like is when people donate things, is that they come with us, that they come with us, to the day labor site, that we do a lot of work at the Home Depots. You go to a, the Home Depots, and you see a lot of guys standing around outside, you've seen them all. They're there looking for work. They're there looking for work. So we go there and we say, you know, so how's it been going? You know, have you had, when was the last time you worked? Three days ago, or it's been a couple of weeks. How about your family, how's your family doing? We never ask them their immigration status, because we don't care. They're all human beings. They all deserve to be treated with love. And then uh, and some of these guys will go out and work for a week, and then at the end of the week, the person that hired him will say, you didn't do a good enough job. I'm sorry, I'm not going to pay you. And they figure that the person's going to be so scared to call the authorities. So I said, well, call us. We'll, we'll handle it. So we had an issue not too long ago, 33rd in El Cajon. There's a group of guys that stand out there by the Frizzy Paint store. And there's a Pancho Villas across the street. So uh, they called me. They said, these people harassing us. Small group of people. They're coming out from the, the neighborhood and harassing us. Sort of like what the Minutemen used to do. There was this, this uh, group here called the Minutemen. There was a, it, was a, it was a national organization, these hate groups. And uh, fortunately, they didn't last too long because they really represented the worst of the American spirit. Uh, and, and they would go out and really do terrible things. Well, in this case, these were Minutemen like people. Three people, just three people. And they would go there, and these, these guys would be out there, about 10 or 12 guys, you know, looking for work. And they would get in their face and take pictures of them and start screaming at them and tell them to go back where they came from and things like that. So I said, well, you know, let me handle that. So I went out there, and two of the three guys showed up, and they really tried to, be, you know, they tried to be really scary, but they saw that I wasn't scared. And we, we have a lot of uh, school groups that come with us, and I'll never forget it. That day when we were out there at that day labor site at that 33rd and Alcohol, I had Gonzaga University with me, right? Catholic school from Washington State. And, and when they heard me talking to these people, because these people were saying all these crazy things, and I, I would have a response. I wasn't expecting this to happen, but every time I responded, they'd clap. They start clapping. So like, we're not kind of like in a discussion, and I'd say something, and they'd all clap. And I, I turned around too because I was thinking, why is it clapping? And, and the, the, the two people that were like the uh, the nativist people, they would look over at it and stuff, and I go, this is pretty good. I go, like an audience behind you. Like, and I was just telling them, well, you know, they actually do have the right to stand here, as long as they're not blocking the sidewalk, and and and, the, and these types of things. But anyways. Uh, so the Border Rangers, I think, were best known for something we started doing back in 1996, which was to put water in the desert. We started putting water in the desert back then, because in 1994, the United States, which the previous decade had said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now in 1994, the United States built a wall. So you say, wait a minute, you're telling this part of the world not to build one, and then you're building one. And you're building one with a friendly country that you took the land from. It's even worse. And so anyways, um, I said, well, you know, we've got to do something about that. Because before that wall was built, one or two people would die every month crossing. They'd get hit by a car, things like that. But after that wall was built, in October of 1994, because the fiscal year for the U.S. starts October 1st, after that wall was built, now you have one or two people die every day. Every single day, one or two people will die. You're talking about children, women. Fourteen people were killed in Victoria, Texas, just about two years ago. And it didn't even come out of the news here in San Diego. So I went to the news and I said, you know, these 14 people were killed because the Border Patrol was chasing their car and it flipped over. And 14 people were killed. They shouldn't be chasing those cars. If they suspect that the car has undocumented people, send a helicopter out there, set up a roadblock, do something, but don't chase them. Because they're going to be scared, they're going to drive really fast and the car might flip. And that's what happened. And then I said, but not only that, in May of 2003, not too far from where that accident happened, 19 human beings died. And it was a little boy, a five-year-old little boy named Marco, uh, Marco Antonio Villasenor that crossed with his dad. And as he crossed with his dad, he asked his dad for some water. And his father wouldn't give him any water. So he asked the next man and the next man. He asked 18 men for water. And neither of these 18 men would give the little boy water. And why not? They were already dead. The father was dead. The 17 other men were dead. And the little boy also dies. In Victoria, Texas, in May of 2003. 
Now, besides the people that were at San Diego State earlier today, you've never heard this story. These are human beings dying every day. There was a woman, I don't remember, you might have heard this story because it came out of the news a bit, uh, Guadalupe Beltran. Guadalupe Beltran was a woman that during the fires of 2007, remember that big fire storm in October of 2007? Well, she had gone home to bury her dad. She had gone home to bury her dad, and she had decided to come back. And she was going to contract a smuggler, and she said, but I can't pay. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, you should cross right now because the Border Patrol is really busy because of the fires. And the Border Patrol was very busy. You know, the, the fire department was out there, but the Border Patrol was also busy. And they said, they're going to be so busy, you're going to be able to get across, and, and they won't find you. Well, she did get across, kind of, and they did find her eventually after she was 99% of her body was burnt. And I remember her, her husband called me and said, you know, my, uh, and I get calls like this every week, if not every day sometimes. And she said, uh, he said, my wife, she was returning from Mexico, she was crossing out of this area, I haven't heard anything about it. Do you know anything? And I go, I, know, I don't know anything about it. Have you called the Mexican consulate? Have you called the authorities, checked with the hospitals, etc.? And he was panicking. He had three little kids. So uh, what happened was, eventually, they found out that there was a woman at Sharps Hospital in La Jolla that was totally burnt, and you couldn't recognize her. Uh, but they thought this might be the woman. So they asked him to go to the hospital to see if they thought, if he thought it was his wife. Can't imagine, you know. And, and uh, the woman always used to paint her fingernails white. And two of the fingers, were, they were all charred, except two of the fingers. You could see the white fingernail polish. He realized that was his wife, leaving behind three children. Lucrecia Dominguez, dying in the arms of Jesus, her 15-year-old son Jesus, as they were crossing through the Arizona desert. These things are happening every day, 10,000 human beings. And we don't know the stories. We need to personalize the stories. And what really impacted me on the personalizing of the stories was Schindler's List. When I saw Schindler's List, the movie, I thought, how, how, how can people stand by and not do anything? As we know, a lot of people did. Uh, did stand by and do nothing. And then there was Schindler that saved 4,000 of our Jewish brethren. But did you know that the Mexican consulate, Gilberto Bosques, he was the Mexican consulate to France during World War II, he didn't save 4,000 Jews. He saved 40,000 Jews. Nobody knows about this guy. I was, a, I was invited to a, a, a Jewish film festival a couple of years ago, and I saw the, the documentary about him. And I asked some of my friends that are Jewish and happen to be Latino, I go, did you know about this guy? They go, no. I go, this guy, people need to know these stories. And I found out that his, his grandson, also named Gilberto Bosques, lives in Tijuana. So we honored him this, uh, this February. We had an event this February, February 14th on purpose, Valentine's Day, called Faith, Hope, and Charity. And we honored three people. We honored Madre Antonia, who was the, the nun from Beverly Hills, a woman from Beverly Hills, twice married and divorced, that happened to go down to Tijuana one day with a priest friend of hers. And that priest's mission was to visit prison, prisoners. Like in Matthew 25, another one was, I was in prison and you visited me. That's what his mission was. And she saw that and she fell in love with that mission. So she started her own order. Her own order. Here's a woman from Beverly Hills, lots of money. She gave it all up. She got a special permission to start this order. And she, uh, she ended up living in a prison called the Mesa in Tijuana for 25 years. The cell is as small as this pew and a really small, you know, like eight by eight cell or something. She did that purposefully. She passed away last year, so we honored her at the Faithful and Charity Brunch. We also honored a, a retired judge who was the highest ranking Latina judge in the country, Irma Gonzalez. And so we honored her because I wanted her to be an inspiration to especially young, young uh, women. And then the third person that we honored was Gilberto Bosques. And I asked his grandson to give a talk about who his grandfather was. Because we've got to honor these people. You know, the power of one, the starfish. Because all of a sudden somebody goes, really? That person did all those things? And that's what we're trying to do with, with the work that we're doing with, with Border Angels. And I remember the first time I heard the story of the starfish from Mahatma Gandhi's grandson. Uh, I'm out in the desert, not too long after that, putting water in the desert, because that's what we're best known for. And I'm with this other guy, this other volunteer. He was from Tijuana. And as we're, as we're driving, we look at the distance and we see a guy kind of stumbling around. So we pull over and we go running right over to him. We're bringing water, because you could tell he was in trouble. And as I approached him, I realized it wasn't one guy, it was two guys. The guy was carrying somebody on his back. And I thought, oh my God, so, so we, you know, we take the two people and we put them underneath some, some trees, give them a little shade, and we give them water. And the guy that was on his back was about to die. So I was going to take him to the hospital in Calexico, and the other guy goes, oh no, the Border Patrol. And I go, number one priority is to keep him alive. Got to keep him alive. 
And I thought, let's see how he responds to the water. You know, I can give him 30 seconds or not much more because he's going to die. And immediately he responded to the water. So we stood with, we, we sat there with these two guys for about three or four hours. Made sure they were okay and in a safe place, water, food, a little money, things like that. And then we left. We left to put more water out in the desert. There's people crossing all the time. And uh, two weeks later, I get a call at Qualcomm. That's what the Padres used to play before. I get a call at Qualcomm, and it's a little boy. And he goes, hi, sir, you don't know me, but my name is Francisco. And two weeks ago, my dad told me you saved his life in the Imperial Valley. And I'm going, where are you calling me from? He goes, Los Angeles. My grandmother died, and my dad went to bury her. He's the only breadwinner in the family. So he's coming back to provide for our family here in Los Angeles. How's your dad doing? Oh, he's okay, you know, and, and so forth. And I go, well, God bless you, and all that. And then I said, uh, by the way, how's your dad's friend doing? And he goes, what friend? I go, your dad didn't tell you? Your dad was carrying somebody on his back. So this Francisco guy, he does all of this. He doesn't even tell his son that he saved somebody's life. I go, that's a different level. I can't even relate to that. This guy's amazing. Well, two weeks later, I got a call from that friend's son. And, his, and, and he calls me and he goes, hi, sir, you don't know me. But I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the, the, the son of the man that was on his back. And I want to let you know that my dad's fine. And I go, where are you calling me from? And he goes, Chicago. So I couldn't believe that these two young men were calling me. They were the sons of the two men. They were calling me from Los Angeles and from Chicago, and that they were fine. And I, so when people say, do you think Border Angels makes a difference? And I say, I will say, I don't know. But it sure made a difference to Francisco and Pedro. That was the man's name. Francisco and Pedro. And when I go and speak at schools, and I speak at schools all, all the time, like today I was at San Diego State, but I especially like it, I love to speak at San Diego State, but especially like it when I'm speaking to like a junior high or high school, and I speak to them all over the country. I just had a Dallas Hall High School from Concord, California with me for a week, uh, you know, share these stories with them. And I go, you know, the, the, that power of one is very powerful because uh, the person that's really going to make change in this world is that person that you look at in the mirror every day. And, and, and your story might not be as dramatic as the story of Francisco and Pedro. It might be more dramatic. And I said, one of the things that's totally out of control, we see it, you know, we adults are really misbehaving. You see how the, 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 the if you're a red state, a blue state, right or left, and that is, that is so terrible that that is going on right now because it really has frozen the country from moving forward. As a matter of fact, it's moving backwards. And, but I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope because of the youth. And when I go and I give these talks and I say, um, you know, we really got to treat people with love and, and dignity because when you make fun of that person because they wear the same clothes every day to school, you have no idea what their situation is. They wish they had money. They wish they could have a nice you know, pair of tennis shoes or whatever. And, and, and this bullying stuff has just gotten totally out of control. And it's happened with the adults, with these issues on immigration and, and the hate towards the migrants. And I shared a story earlier today, which is a very powerful story. And it's the story of uh, the power of words and the terminology that we use. We never say illegal immigrant or illegal alien or anchor baby, because those are hateful terms. You may have used them and, and not meant to say it in a hateful way, but it really dehumanizes people. It dehumanizes people. And all of you, you know, wherever you came from, there was things that people said about you too, using derogatory terms and so forth, to dehumanize you. And, and for us, it's very important to, uh, to treat people with dignity and respect, because this person that I'm thinking about, he, said, he once said, those people, you know, they only want to speak their own language, they only want to hang out in their own neighborhoods, they only want to wave their own flags, they should go back to where they came from. And I know you've heard Roger Hedgecock and, and Lou Dobbs and people like that say that, and that's too bad. But the person I'm talking about is Benjamin Franklin. And he was talking about Germans. The Germanization of this country. Get those Germans out of here. And had he had his way, some of you would not be sitting in this church right now. Because um, he was, you know, and, 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 and we've never heard in our lifetime, oh, there's too many Germans in this country. <laughs> but there was a time. There was a time. There was a time they said there was too many Polish, too many Italians, too many Irish, and now they're saying too many Mexicans. It was wrong to say it back then, and it's even more wrong to say it now. When, the, when, when the people were coming from Europe, the U.S. had nothing to do with that situation. As a matter of fact, when the Irish came in the mid-1800s, many of them because of the potato famine, uh, there was no legal or illegal back then. People just came. So it wasn't one, oh, they came the, the correct way. And, and like what I told Lou Dobbs, they go, well, what was the incorrect way? Because people just came. It wasn't like they were turning people away. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, the Irish, I said, when they came, they were welcome to come here and become residents and so forth. But if, they wanted, if the men wanted to become citizens, they said, however, we're at war with Mexico right now. So if you want to become a citizen, 
you know, you, you fight for the United States in the war against Mexico. So some of the men said, okay. And as they went into Mexico, they said, wait a minute. You're only going into Mexico to take their land. This is not a just war. We know about that. England did that to us. You're, you're only going into Mexico because you want to take their land. That is not right. But not only that, Mexico, like Ireland, is a Catholic country. We are not fighting for the United States. The Irish took off their uniforms and suited up and fought for Mexico. So we'll never forget about that. We, we won't forget about that. And these are stories that maybe you don't hear too much in your history books here. Some of you have seen maybe some of the movie versions of some of these things. But the bottom line is we're all the same race, the human race. We need to treat people with dignity and respect. We are the most powerful country in the history of the world. And, and, and it's not fair that with 4.5% of the world's population, this great country consumes almost 40% of the world's natural resources. It's not fair. We should consume 4.5%. Why would we consume more? And we also consume more than half the world's illegal drugs. And that causes a cancer in Colombia, and Peru, and Mexico, and Bolivia. Because that's a demand-driven issue. It's not a supply-driven issue. The drugs. You saw that, that little boy with no more drug war. I am not saying that these other countries shouldn't do more. Of course they should. And they are. In my 50 years of life, we've gone from about the 50th economy in the world to the 12th. I'm talking about Mexico. To the 12th. Because I identify myself as Mexican. I was born here. My parents are Mexican. My brothers and sisters are Mexican. You know, I didn't decide to be born here. I just happened to be born here. When Mexico passed its law about dual nationality, I was the first guy to apply. So my document really has all these zeros and then number one. So I like to tell people, I'm the first Mexican. Uh, but I have a love for this country too. Because I'm proud of my Mexican heritage, like I'm sure you're proud of your ancestry, and you decide to call yourself Irish American or Italian American or just Italian or just American, that is your call. I, I shouldn't tell you what you should be called. I remember one time, I, I know this is crazy, but I think it's important. Uh, one of many times I was on the O'Reilly Factor. So I'm on the O'Reilly Factor, and uh, so Bill O'Reilly's going nuts about, you know, he, I, I usually talking really loud. And I said, Bill, I go, I imagine you're of Irish ancestry. He goes, that's right, and proud of it. I go, that's great. And I go, so if you decide to call yourself Irish American, or Irish or American, that's your call. I can tell you one thing, Bill. There's never been protest about the St. Patrick's Day parades in this country. Yet if I go out there with a Mexican flag and I'm celebrating, people get mad. I go, There's, well, why is that? You know, so he was getting really, really, really upset, and so on and so forth. And, uh, but he's invited me back because I've always thought that Bill O'Reilly, unlike Lou Dobbs, Unlike uh, some of these other terrible people, you know, some people that have these terrible ways, I've always thought O'Reilly is more of a show. Some of these other people really believe that nativist stuff, like Lou Dobbs. Lou Dobbs is, is something else. We got him fired from CNN. Because with Lou Dobbs, I said freedom of speech is fine. But not when that freedom of speech leads people to go out and kill people, or beat people up, and so forth. So in the case of uh, Bill O'Reilly, I, uh, I, was, I was in a situation like this. I was preaching someplace, it was actually a service. And then afterwards, the priest comes up to me and he says, uh, Oh, Enrique, I saw you on, uh, on the news. I said, no, I saw you on TV with my friend yesterday. So I said, so I had no idea what he was talking about. So I said, Father, what was it? Like a news report or, or some documentary or what? And he goes, no, the O'Reilly factor. So I pause and I go, well, Father, I have two questions for you. What do you mean, why in the world are you watching the O'Reilly factor? <laughs> and number two, what do you mean your friend? <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, we went to Catholic school together. We went to Island. I go, really? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. And, and this, this friend of mine, uh, he runs a mission in, in Nicaragua and also in Mexico where he helps a lot of the, the poorer kids that go to the dumps and look for trash and sell it. He tries to, to get them to go to school instead and get funding for their families so the kids don't have So he's a great guy. And so, so I knew about this because my brother used to work with him. So I said, uh, uh, so what's, what's, he, what's he like? And he goes, well, you know, Enrique, the biggest donor to my mission? I go, don't tell me. He goes, it's Bill O'Reilly. I go, wow, I, I, you know, I, I always thought that he was kind of a show, you know, that really wasn't his heart what he was doing. Although what he does causes problems. So Bill O'Reilly, unlike like uh, Lou Dobbs or Michael Savage or some of these crazy little Glenn Beck, you, when you go on those shows, you just go on. All of a sudden you're on for three or four minutes or six minutes, seven minutes max, that's it. But with O'Reilly, before the show starts, he'll always talk to you beforehand. So Enrique, we're gonna talk about the driver's license issue today or we're gonna talk about, you know, whatever. So, and then, so we interact for 30 seconds or so. So the next time I was on his show, I, and, and he goes on right before the show, and I go, hey Bill, I go, I met a friend of yours the other day. Right away he got really quiet, because he had no idea what he was talking about. And I go, and, and he goes, yeah, who was it? And I go, I, I didn't say his name right away, I go, 
he said some really interesting things about you. And I said, he's really quiet. And I knew he wanted to know, so I carried it out, you know, went on and on for a little bit. And I said, Father so-and-so, and he tells me that you're the biggest donor to his mission in, in, in Mexico, and Bill, that's fantastic, thank you. And then he got really serious, he goes, Enrique, whatever you do, don't ever say that on the air. <laughs> Your secret's safe with me. Yeah. So, uh, but it does, the power of words and, 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 and delivering those types of messages causes big problems. Um, every year in February, on February 2nd, which is a historical date and it's a religious date, when the United States invaded Mexico and took half its territory, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2nd, 1848. But it's also a religious date. It's 40 days when, uh, after Christ's birth when he's presented to the temple. And uh, we in Mexico, on January 6th, everywhere in the world it happens, but, in, but we in Mexico, we make our Rosca de Reyes on the day of the Three Kings. And if you cut that Rosca de Reyes, like some of your Mexican friends, and you get the little Jesus figure, you've got to make tamales on February 2nd. You know? So anyways, so on February 2nd, every year, we leave from Friendship Park, and we do a caravan across the country. The first one we did in 2006, and it was called Marcha Migrante. We went 10,000 miles. I had 111 cars. We stopped in 40 cities, and we said, we've got to rise up and protest. What's going on right now? This wall. These crazy laws, the Minutemen, the deaths on the border. We've got to rise up. So we came back on February 28th, we held a press conference. And that spring, we had the biggest marches in the history of the United States. On March, on March 10th in Chicago, 400,000 people took to the streets. On March 25th in Los Angeles, 800,000. On April 9th, right here in San Diego, 100,000. You, you remember those marches? Some of you might have even participated. So every February now, we do March Migrante, every February 2nd. It's called Marcha because the first one was to get people to march. It's also a human rights theme. On the fifth one, I went with a friend of mine named Josefina Lopez. She's a playwright, some of you may have heard of her. She wrote a play called Real Women Have Curves. Then it became a movie, America for Ours Discovered. So anyway, so she came with me on Marcha Migrante Cinco, and she fell in love with our work. So she wrote a new play. It's called Detained in the Desert. It's very successful, the Hoya Playhouse was all over the country. Well, now it's a movie. Now it's a movie. It's showing across the country. It was, in, it was in Philadelphia last week, so I was in Philadelphia last week. I'm going to Chicago on Friday. I'll be showing in Chicago. It's not a documentary, it's a movie. So there's real actors. Have you guys heard of uh, Antonio Banderas? Antonio Banderas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not in it, so I don't know if you heard of him. <laughs> so, anyways, so, so the movie, it was here in San Diego at the San Diego Latino Film Festival. It sold out. I think some of you saw it there. Um, and and, and, and it's, once again, it's the power of what? Instead of one person, this time it's a film. So it's a film and, and it talks about all these issues. The evil character in the film, his name is Lou Becker. Represents Lou Dobbs and Glenn Beck. <laughs> and then the good guy in the film is Enrique Martinez, which is really my character. And I took on the Martinez last name because the, the, the biggest icon on human rights ever along the border, rest in peace, was my good friend Roberto Martinez, passed away a few years ago. So I use Enrique Martinez in, in, in the film. Uh, and these things are very important. We just did March of Migrante 9. That was the one that we just did this past February. No more deaths or deportations. And we talked to people that have been deported, that are veterans, that have fought for this war, for this country. Because of a broken taillight, now they're in Mexico. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. And, and, and it's unbelievable. And we went to the little kids who have been separated from their parents because their mother dropped the kid off at school and she had a broken taillight. And she got pulled over, no driver license, deported. This is happening right now. So we need to, you know, to tell people what is really going on so we can make a difference. Because, like I said, the person that's going to make a difference is the person that we see in the mirror every day. So with the Border Angels, we go out and put water in the desert. We still do that. Because all the groups that come here always want to do that. So now there's about 25 groups that do that. Uh, we go to the day labor sites, like the Home Depots and other places, and make sure the guys are OK. We go to Friendship Park, and we do these activities, like the Children's Day event that we have coming up. I have school groups that come all the time. Uh, we just like the Concord High School group or Dallas Hall High School. They spend a week with us, go to the desert, go to Friendship Park, go to a Chicano Park, go to the day labor sites, go to the cemetery. There's a cemetery in Holtville. That's a little city in Imperial Valley. It's in the middle of your brochure, in the middle of Pamela on the bottom. There's 700 unidentified migrants buried there. It's the biggest mass grave in the United States. These are people that died in the United States that don't have IDs, so they're buried there. John Doe or Jane Doe. So we go there and do prayer and reflection on a regular basis. We're not we're non religious groups, so sometimes I'll have crosses, like when we have Loyola or DePaul University, Notre Dame. Sometimes we'll have stones if it's a Jewish group. Every year we have a, a, a group of Punjabi students from northern India. They don't use crosses or stones, so we put flowers. 
But the same spirit that even though they're not identified, they're not forgotten. So we do this, they close the cemetery now. We can, they have to get special permission to go there and go there about once every six weeks. And, and, and I'll pass around a list of you have already signed it. And if you're interested in getting information about us, put your name and your email on there. And then that way you can find out about the events that are coming up, whether it's Children's Day event, uh, you know, back there that uh, the stained glass there has the nativity scene. And the two Saturdays before Christmas, we do a beautiful event uh, right around, um, well, two Saturdays before Christmas. And it's called Posadas Sin Fronteras. It's a tradition that we have in Mexico where the 12 days before Christmas, you start counting down and you have these, you know, until you get to the part where there's no room at the end. You're all familiar with that story. And then all of a sudden, yes, there's room and then baby Jesus is born and, and we sing on both sides. It's a beautiful event. So that happens at Friendship Park, two Saturdays before Christmas. We do a lot of things. People often think about us just because of the water, because that's the thing that kind of maybe got us on the map. But we do a lot more than that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the last things that we do. The other things that we do is a lot more. I go and speak at schools. We have all of these interns. A lot of them are high school students. Some of them are college students. Some of them are a little older. We, we've had people from other countries that have stayed with us. Juliana just left. She's from Colombia, the country of Colombia. She was with us for a year. We work a lot with High Tech High. So we have three uh, high school student seniors that are with us right now that are doing a great job. So there's lots of different things that you might want to uh, participate in. And then I do want to take some questions and, and, and so forth, but I wanted to mention there's a couple of ways that you can also help us. We have this book that was written by Dr. Ricardo Griswold del Castillo, and it's called The Power of One, The Border Angel Story. So it's got some of the stories that I've shared and, and uh, pictures and things like that. And it's a $20 donation. And then we also have this t-shirt, which has our logo on the front. We've got small, medium, large, and extra large. And on the back, El um, Amor No Tiene Fronteras. Love has no borders. And we asked for a $20 donation um, on these as well. But since we're in the sacred place, uh, they're usually $20 each. Two for 40. Two for 40 and we're kind of inspired. We're kind of inspired in here, so uh, kind of generous. But anyways, um, that's pretty much the Border Angel story. And, and uh, we'd love to have you participate. Now, who can go on the caravan next year? Probably none of you. I mean, who's, who has that kind of time? But maybe you can see when we leave or when we come back or support us in other manners or, or when we do these different campaigns. We're doing a very uh, interesting campaign next Thursday, which we're going to be talking. We have a group coming in from New York. Uh, Reverend, you might be interested in this, and it's going to be, uh, they're going to talk to us about how to effectively deliver a message, whether it's social media or the email or, or a press conference or a press release. These are experts from New York. It's going to be an all-day conference at our office, so if anybody's interested, let me know. So we're doing a lot of different things. We have Immigration Tuesdays. We have programs. We have, like, Pam, the, the, the woman that put together that video. Not only is she excellent at doing that, she's an excellent photographer and an excellent painter. She teaches at a lot of schools. She paints, so we have different programs like that. So we have a lot of different types of things that we're doing and involved in, and we hope that all of these things will, you know, will make a difference in somebody's life. And that's why we do what we do, and, and I'm delighted to be here. I don't know how much time I have, but I thought this would be a good time to maybe do some questions and answers if anybody has any questions, and maybe I'll have the answers. Thank you very much for such a good I have a lot more to say, but I wanted to see if you guys have some questions. You got ten, ten minutes, Enrique. Ten minutes? Okay, great. Yes. Um, today, I was I had the privilege of hearing you at uh, San Diego State University. Um, I think it's really important for people to hear the um, <clears throat> the explanation of the comment, your comment. There is no fly. Right. Okay. This the whole the whole visa. Right. Papers, all of that is really important. When you made the comment, there is no lie. That's right. Uh, on the back of the brochure, there's a section called myths, myths versus realities, and what, and some of these myths that are out there. One of the one of the biggest ones is that one. For example, somebody says, "I have no problem with immigration. I should just get a line." The problem is, there is no line. There is no line. Unlike when you when you came or when my parents came, they were able to get a visa and so forth. That doesn't exist for most people today. Because if you're not at, at a particular economic level, you do not qualify for a visa. So it's not like, well, I'm gonna see what they say. They're gonna say no. If you don't make a certain amount of money, and I'm talking about, that is, it's, it's a very low standard. People don't make that kind of money. And those are the ones that are crossing in the desert risking their lives. They would much rather apply for a visa and not have to risk their lives. But they know they're gonna say no. They know that when they pay that $600 to apply, they're gonna tell them no and they're not gonna get a refund. So why would they do that? 
and they want to have a better life. It's a universal human right to be able to cross borders, to look for work, or to be with your family, etc. So that's a big myth right there about the line. There is no line. There needs to be a line. There is no line today. There are exceptions, because somebody will say, well, you know, Jose over here, I know he doesn't have very much money. He was in very rare exceptions. Uh, there's 11, it's about 11 and a half undocumented people in the country today. 11 and a half million. That's out of 250 million around the world. Most actually go to other countries. But the ones that come here is 11 and a half million. And of that 11 and a half million, 35% did qualify for visas and did get visas. Those are exceptions. Those are people with money, mainly from Asia and from Europe. They got a work visa, a tourist visa, or a student visa. They're supposed to be here for a certain amount of time and then go back. Their visa expired, so they're undocumented and they never left. So these are people, those, those are 35% of the, the, of the uh, 11.5 million. There's a few Latinos in there, but most of those people are from Asia and from Europe. People that have money, just think about it. If you're going to send your kids to school overseas, you have money. Or visit overseas, visit as a tourist. Or go work overseas, you know, you have money. So anyways, the other 65% in general do not qualify for those visas. They're the ones hiding in the trunk of a car or, or you know, freezing in the mountains or dying in the desert. That, yeah, because there is no, another one. This is a country of laws. Well, if you think of your countries, wherever your great-great-grandparents are from, most of those countries are also countries of laws. And, and those countries, like this country, has had some bad laws. Child labor, women couldn't vote, slavery. Those are all laws of this land. So there are laws that are immoral. Two people dying every day, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. And let's not forget that the overwhelming majority, because another thing that happens out there with the, with the media, by some, you know, Fox, because as we know, there's Fox and there's facts. So uh, <laughs> most of the people in Mexico, like my people, like my family, they don't want to go anywhere else, and they don't. All my family lives in Mexico. Most people in Mexico have no desire to come here unless it's to go to Disneyland or go shopping or something. <laughs> and like, why would you want to leave your country, your culture, your language, your food? These are people just like your forefathers and foremothers. That decided there was a better opportunity elsewhere, and they left. But most of the people stay put. Because they, they try to portray it like, oh, everybody wants to come here. Oh, well, they don't want to come here now. From, from the unauthorized migrants in this country today, from Mexico, there's been a 40% drop in the last four years. 40% less are coming because the economy in Mexico has gotten better. Not better than the U.S. economy, but better than what the economy was in Mexico before, so they don't leave. Now the newest wave of immigrants is no longer Mexicans. Now it's Central Americans. They're the ones that are coming here in bigger numbers. But overall, migration to this country has dropped dramatically. It's a zero sum. It's a zero sum as far as people going back, some voluntarily and some because they're being deported. Every president deports more than the pre previous president. And President Obama is no exception. Let me tell you, I know, I know you have a question, but I forgot to share the story earlier, and I think it's a good story. Um, I have type 2 diabetes. So I have to go to my eye doctor every six months to get a checkup. So my appointment is going to be the next day, Wednesday. I'll never forget. So on Tuesday, in the evening, I get a call from the White House. And they say, President Obama would like you to be on this call with 10 other national leaders. Can you do it? I go, oh, yeah, of course. I've met with the president before and all this. So uh, what time is the call at? 8.30 in the morning. OK. So my doctor's appointment is at 7.30. So I go to my doctor downtown, Sharp Street, Steely. And I see my doctor, and I say, hey, doctor, I go, I got a really important phone call at 8.30. How long is this uh, eye exam going to last? And he did no more than 40 minutes. I go, doctor, it's very important that it's only 40 minutes at most. You know, normally you wouldn't be so persistent with your doctor, right? So she says, no problem. I go, okay. So half an hour into the exam, I realize she's not even halfway done. So I, I said something I never would say. I said, hey, doctor, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to leave and then finish this exam some other day. I mean, nobody would ever do that, right? And then so she got, you know, appropriately, she got mad. And she goes, how important is that phone call? Is it with the President of the United States? And I said, and, and I had no idea what her political leanings were at that moment. And I said, actually it is, it's with President Obama. So she starts screaming, I love the President. I love she was so full of decorum, up to that moment. She's like, how excited, calls the nurse. I thought, oh my God. So then she says, why don't you make that call from my office? Uh, she's gonna walk in. She's gonna make up something and walk in. And I go, I'm sorry, I, I really need kind of secure thing. And I said, I'll tell you what, why don't you put the eyebrows in? I'll go to my car, do the call, and then I'll come back and tell you all about it. She goes, okay. So she puts the eyebrows in. I go to my car, I leave the parking lot, I park at Balboa Park, which is like a couple of blocks away, because I needed to have some privacy. So by the time I get to my car, my phone is one of these little phones. 
I can't see the numbers. My eyes are all dilated. So I'm trying to, and there's like a code, so I have to feel around, and finally I, I get through to the White House. And just as the president's getting on the phone, because uh, there's first a White House person, and then also the president's about to come on or whatever, there's a knock on my window, kind of hard, and it was a meter maid. She's pointing at something. I can't see what she's pointing at, but I know it's not good. So I, and I couldn't say, I'm on the phone with the president. I said, yeah, come on. So I just kind of drive very carefully, and I park someplace else, and, and, uh, and anyway, so, so we do the phone call, and what the president was telling me was that the next day the Senate was going to come out with a couple of amendments on the bill, and that I wasn't going to like it, and, and I didn't like it. What the amendments were, were the U.S.-Mexican border is 2,000 miles long. The walls between the countries are wherever there's a city, like San Diego, Tijuana, that's where the walls are. 700 miles of the border has walls. What the amendment wanted to do was make it 1,400 miles. So two-thirds of the, the border would have walls. Right now there's 20,000 border patrol agents. The amendment wanted to double it to 40,000. What do you think of it? And I go, Mr. President, with all due respect, we, we cannot accept it. When your forefather got the right to vote, uh, if they would have said 300 African Americans have to die every year because of that, you would have said, no way. That's what it'll cost us. 300 more people will die a year because of that doubling of the wall and doubling of the border patrol. It's unacceptable. We don't want it. And so we kind of shot it down. And so right now, there's not, there, there really wasn't going to be immigration reform anyways. You know, the Congress is not helping the president at all. So I'm meeting with the president next month. And we're going there. We're saying, what we want you to do, Mr. President, is uh, pass the DREAM Act. Pass deferred action. For these little kids that were brought across the border when they were little, let them become documented. I know the Democrats want them to be citizens. They, they don't care about that. They, they just want to be documented. Their parents, them, whatever the case may be. And then the other thing, the number one industry, the most powerful economy in the country, that's California, is agriculture. 80% of the farm workers are undocumented. Let them be documented. So those are three things. Pass DACA, pass the Dream Act, pass the Ag Jobs Bill. And number four, stop the deportations. Stop the deportations. Those few that are really criminals, they should be in jail, deport them. That's, 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 there's no issue with that. But the overwhelming majority of the people that you're deporting are gardeners, are housewives, children. They're not criminals. You know, they, you know, and, so forth. and a lot of them, they spend most of their lives here, including deported veterans and, and children and, and so forth. Some of them don't even remember, they're not only being sent to Mexico, these are people from all over the world. The majority still, still, because of the numbers and because we're right next door, are from Mexico. But whether they're from Mexico or from China or from wherever, these are human beings. Let them you know, stay here and so forth. If it's a criminal, put them in jail. But if not, you know, don't, don't be, so that's what we're working on, and we're going to go back and see the president. We think he's going to do that, and then when we have our next president in 2016, we are sure that she will have a humane <laughs> I know I shouldn't be promoting Sarah Palin or Michelle Obama. <laughs> okay, another question. You just answered my question. Oh. I, I wondered what you would consider immigration. Um, right. So apart from those things, with, with the next president, whoever that might be, uh, we want the people to be able to get in line, and, and, and this is a supply and demand issue. If there's no jobs, they're not going to come. We've seen that that happen, the you know, drop, 40 percent drop. So let them get in line and, and let them be documented. Not citizens. Let them be documented. My mom is, is documented. She's not a citizen. My dad just passed away a few months ago, and he was in the same situation. The only difference, in essence, between uh, a documented person and a citizen is the documented person can't vote, but they do everything else you do. They, they pay taxes and everything. Even the undocumented people pay taxes, like, like the myths on the back there. Um, oh, those people, they, they're freeloaders. They don't pay taxes. I can guarantee you that you've never been to Mariposa ice cream, and the person in front of you is speaking in Spanish, and then the, the, the people there say, notice you're speaking Spanish. Are you documented or undocumented? If you're undocumented, you don't have to pay taxes for that ice cream. <laughs> pay taxes. They pay, the undocumented people pay $7 billion a year just in Social Security. How could that be? They don't get social security cards. But as an undocumented person, I can go down to the social security office right now, and they give you something called an identification tax number. The only reason you would get that is because you're undocumented. So otherwise, you get a social security card. So I that, that for employment. For employment. So, I yeah. About you, you, for the employer. Right. How important do you think that is? Okay, let me, let me just get. I'll answer that. But as far as the identification tax number, so I work at the restaurant. My boss pays me. Since I have an ITM number, identification tax number, they take out that 25%. I never see that. When I retire, I never see that. That goes to Social Security. That's where the $7 billion comes from. 
As far as the e-verify, electronic verification, of if, if the person really is who they are, if it was, if it was uh, false proof, if it, if it was effective, if it was accurate, there's no problem with that. The thing is, there's a lot of mistakes. It happened to me. I was born and raised in San Diego. Um, I was born at Mercy Hospital. So when I went to get my driver's license renewed, they would not give me my driver's license because my social security card or my driver's license, one of the two had the entire last name. Morones, my dad's last name, and Cariaga, my mom's last name. The other one only had Morones. So they said, oh, you're not that person. I'm not that person. So I was able to just go down to social security and get it straightened out. But other people get fired, harassed, and they don't know, you know how to do those things. If he verify was, was accurate, which is not right now, and maybe someday, I would have no problem with that. I have no problem with you going in and checking these people out to see if they have a criminal record, because the overwhelming majority do not. So that people try to say that, oh, we're going to be checking your background, fine. Just like when you know, the people in this, this uh, sanctuary, when they came, at Ellis Island, unless you were visibly had very bad health issues or you were a known criminal, they let you in. That should be the same today. It should be the same today. They did enforce that. There would be fewer people coming because, as you said, they come to the job. Mm -hmm. So I'm in favor of that e-verification to see if they, you know, to see if they have a criminal background. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and like I said, if it was happening, there'd be no problem. The other thing is this, and, and I you didn't, you didn't say this, but that might be a question. Oh, you've heard this. Oh, they're taking our jobs. They're taking our jobs, these people. How many people in this, in this sanctuary here have lost their job to an undocumented people? I know none of you, but, but how many of you know somebody? That's probably none of you. It does happen, but it's very rare. Because the jobs that they're doing are the jobs that your forefathers and foremothers did 200 years ago. The hardest jobs. There was a campaign two years ago by the United Farm Workers. And it was called, Take Our Jobs. Please. Because we need more farm workers. We do need, need more farm workers. They said, please, take our jobs. There's more jobs even, even with the people here. There's a lot of openings. Take them. National campaign, 12 people signed up. 12 people signed up, 11 quit within two hours. One person lasted two days. That was it. And they interviewed the person that's the head of the United Farm Workers, Arturo Rodriguez, on the Stephen Colbert Report. Uh, it was, and and it, was, it was to prove that point. It was to prove the point that it does happen, but it's very rare. It's very rare. You know, there might be somebody that bumps that guy at the McDonald's, or there might be some of that, but it's very rare. It's very rare, uh, and so it's more of a scary tactic. Oh, they're taking their jobs. Oh, really? You know? Uh, and then another one. Oh, welfare and all that. They don't qualify for those programs. They don't qualify for welfare. They don't qualify for those programs. Yes, you the last question. Yeah. Uh, what country has the most compassionate uh, immigration policy, and what can we learn from it? Um, and, well, I don't know which country has the most passionate, but I know, uh, for example, Canada is much more passionate than the United States. Well, Canada and then the European Common Union, what they did about letting people cross borders and look for work and all that. But as far as Canada, what they, what they will do, they'll even fly down, let's just talk about Mexico and Canada. They'll, they'll fly people from Mexico to, to Canada to work, and let's suppose you're my boss and, and you're mistreating me, I can quit and then, and then apply for another job. With the old guest worker program, you couldn't do that. If you complain, you are out of here. So that led to a lot of abuse of the workers, of the people that in the guest worker program. And that's another thing, terminology. Guest worker. Either you're a guest or you're a worker. You don't invite somebody to your house, hey, maybe come on over. You're not going to say, you can be my guest worker. <laughs> Either I'm going to be staying with you for a couple of days or I'm going to be the guy working on the yard for a couple of days. So there should be humane, intelligent, like the driver's license. No, we should have driver's licenses. And we will in California next year again. Think about it. Wouldn't you rather have that guy driving next to you that sideswipes your car, know that he knows the rules, has insurance, is registered, or just have him randomly driving, and then if that happens, he's going to take off. This would be important. So, so some of these, they don't make sense. Because that person's going to drive anyways. They're going to drive to work, they're going to drive to, 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 to kids to school. And these are the people that you all know. These are the people that prepared that meal at the last restaurant you ate at, maybe even served the food. Definitely pick that fruit that you had in your salad. So, you know, and, and I, can, I can remind you, it was you 200 years ago. And one of the things that President Obama said, one of the many things that he said that I, I think is brilliant, before we were us, we were them. Before we were us, as in us as a country, and also as in US, right, before we were us. But him it really only applies to half of him because, of course, his dad's from Africa. But his mom's case, before, it was, there were migrants when they first came here, uh, you know, his mom. And so, so before we were us, we were them. And, and we tend to forget that. I tend to forget that. Because the loudest voices against humane immigration policies are definitely not Native Americans. 
it's people that also came from another part, another part of the world. So, yeah, Canada has much more humane laws. The European Common Union has more humane laws. They've really liberalized uh, or uh, have more, more compassionate laws in the south part of Mexico, where you can't cross the border. Because a lot of them are actually going to Mexico. A lot of them aren't coming to the United States, aren't using it as a, a trampoline. They're going to Mexico because the economy is stronger, the language is the same, and so on and so forth. So, we all have work to do, all of us, to improve our, you know, what we can do. That's why uh, I like to say that, you know, that what I said earlier about the change, it starts with that person that we look at in the mirror every day. And, uh, and I really thank you all. So I'm